And bless the Lord. I welcome everybody that's listening live and those that will be watching on the Now Network. If you haven't watched the broadcast, I encourage you to do that. We've got some, some new things planned here uh, in the future. Uh, we've got a lot going on here at the church. Got some expansion plans that I want to share with you later as I'm able to reveal that. But uh, just good, good, good days are ahead of the church. Amen. And I'm, I'm glad that we can be a part of that. Well, let's pray and ask God's blessing on this service. Heavenly Father, we love you. We lift up every need before your throne that we've mentioned today to you, these that are dealing with surgeries, these that are dealing with pains in their body, these, Father God, that need a miracle. Nothing is impossible for you. And so we speak these blessings, Father God, upon this church, upon your people, those who have written and asked for prayer. We believe in prayer. We believe you're the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and you change not. It's impossible for you to change. And so, Father, with faith, we reach out to you and we say thank you for making a way when there seems to be no way. No matter what the report is, we believe the report of the Lord. Father, now hide me behind the shadow of the cross. Let Jesus get all the praise, the honor, and the glory. Manifest yourself today, Father God, so those who hear this word would run with the vision and come closer to you in this hour. We thank you for it, Holy Spirit. Welcome into Ignited Church. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. amen. Well, I'm uh, going to sound like a broken record, but I love you. Uh, I appreciate this house. I appreciate what's going on. Those that are uh, part of this ministry beyond these four walls from all different places. We're getting new people contacting us from all over. Just received a letter from Wisconsin. Uh, of a person healed of cancer through their faith in God and what they have been believing for and just wanted to let us know that they're being encouraged by the ministry here. Um, you know, it, these things, you just, you can't buy these things. These are, these are not things you can manipulate. These are things you just say, God, thank you for your faithfulness. So uh, you as a local body, I thank you for your love for the, for the church of Jesus Christ. Here's the word the Lord spoke to me. He said, the American dream is fading. It is the twilight of her freedom. For she has forsaken the cross, and she has divorced herself from the power of my blood. Lost and drowning in false peace and hope, she clings to a dream that has been shattered by the reality of sin. America the great shall shake both in the natural and the spirit. And I will lay again a foundation of righteousness through the prayers of my righteous ones. I want to stop and say to you today that there is coming a shaking of the church. There's coming a rearranging of church leadership. There's coming a calling of those who are in the cave of Adullam with a giant killer. Those that have been with David, those that have been with the king, Lord Jesus. And God is going to raise up a mighty movement and a mighty church in these last days. If you're a part of that remnant, say amen. amen. He said, these will burn ever so brightly in a darkened nation. Cling to me as the shaking begins. Hold on to me as the flood waters rises, and I am your sure hand in times of conflict and crisis. I will never leave, and I will never forsake. Even as you're bent, I will never allow the world to break you. It's a powerful word this morning. It's an encouraging warning word and a warning mixed together. I believe we're in that hour that you have to bring the two together. I believe that messages must be balanced with reality and the possibilities of a great future for the church. I say possibilities because the church has to make the decision, do I want to enter in to this great movement of God. Do I really want to see the presence of God poured out? And am I willing to pay the price to see that happen? Again, the remnant will say, 
amen and amen. We want it to happen. As I was, uh, again, preparing, the Lord spoke these words to me, said, don't look back. And that's the title of this message today, don't look back. Don't look back. Again, I have the duty to bring a, a hard message to the body of Christ and all those who will listen. Um, and I, I, I have no pretense whatsoever. I have no uh, shame whatsoever to speak the word of the Lord. I, I'm going to stand before God for everything that I say to his body. Everything that comes from these lips of clay, one day they will be revealed and they will be analyzed and I will be judged not by my merits, but by this book right here. And the funny thing is, so will you. <laughs> Judgment day is the day of being equal. Is that right? So I'm going to preach this message to you with all sincerity of my heart. It's going to be a little raw. It's going to be a little rough. And if you're not mature enough, you need to go ahead and tip on out now. We already got your offering, so you can Minister Kofi, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, we, we already got that, so you can go on ahead if you need to. Just come back next week. <laughs> this message is not going to be about Lot's wife, as you would assume from hearing the title, though there's some connection and you can make your own observation. But this message is about the death of the American dream. The American dream that you and I grew up hoping for and even had a little bit of an embrace, even had a little bit of taste of what that American dream looked like. But the reality is the American dream has turned into a nightmare. I want to kick against the pricks and I want to go against the stream of normal Christianity today and let you know unequivocally, without a shadow of a doubt, America will never be great again. And I understand that will fly in the face of a lot of people who dwell in false peace and false hope. But the numbers just don't add up in our favor. The reality on the ground, the boots on the ground, if you will, the report from the battle line tells us that we are losing this war and really have lost this war for our nation. And I believe that if you're spending time in the political arena trying to gain ground and trying to build sand castles. You are wasting God's time and God's money and wasting the energy of God's people. It's time to build the kingdom of God. It's time to build a kingdom that you cannot shake it. You cannot break it. You cannot get in any other way than through the door called Jesus. And so I'm going to talk about that this morning. I'm not a fatalist. I'm a realist. I have great hope. I have great expectation of my family and this ministry. I have great expectation of the word of God and prophecy. But I am a realist and I understand that you cannot continue to do what you do as a nation and expect the blessings of God to be upon you. As I was getting this word and he actually had given me the message, the title first, don't look back. I was like, you know. God, there's a lot of people that feel this way and they feel that way. He spoke this to me. He says, prophecy does not go backwards. I'm not talking about a prophecy from a man. I'm not talking about personal prophecy. I'm talking about the word of God. It doesn't go backwards. It moves forward. It's always forward moving. There's always a reality of what God has set into motion. And that's the problem with the American church today. We do not recognize and realize the hour that we're living in. Let me give you the scripture reference that I'm going to preach from. You wouldn't believe it, but Jeremiah chapter 17. Believe me, I've got more chapters than just Jeremiah. And I don't have a tattoo of his name on me anywhere. So it's just where we're going. Amen. Jeremiah Chapter 17, we've been here before. I don't know when, but it was sometime before. And we're going to minister this morning on not looking back. What are we not going to look back on? Well, we're not going to look back on the reality and the pipe dream, if you will, 
that we're going to be great and we're going to be wonderful and that we're leaving our children anything of good value should the Lord tarry. I wish, I hope, I pray the church gets this message today. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 1, are you there? The sin of Judah, you can put your name there, you can put anybody's name there, you can put America's name there, you can put Canada, you can put the world. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. This is heavy duty. And with the point of a diamond, and it is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of your altars. He says there's an indelible mark of sin. There's an indelible mark of sin upon the nation of America. Though we can sit and count the great things about this country, Every single day, the balance is showing us how bad we really are, and the scales are tipping against us because of our sin. He said that it was in the hearts and the altars, representing the people of the nation of Judah, the people of Israel, and the verifiable fact of the people of America. In our hearts, there's an indelible mark of sin. I'm just going to go ahead and let this thing go. From the time we're young children, we're exposed to the sin of the world, the sins of our parents, the sins of our nation. We hear of scandal after scandal, whether it's in the White House or it's in the church house. We hear of the death, the murder, the rape, the molestation, the craziness, the wars and the rumors of wars and all the negativity that our nation can produce on television, movies and arts and entertainment. Can anybody help me? And it becomes an indelible mark written upon the conscience of our children and written upon the future and destroys the innocency of their minds. You and I are a creation of what we were raised up in. My sin reflected the reality of the environment that I lived in. I didn't live in a monastery. Some of you might have come from a monastery, but I didn't come from a monastery. My mama wasn't a nun. And my daddy wasn't a priest. Is any, anybody here today? So the reality, and I can tell by the way that you're looking at me, you've lived where I used to live. In fact, you were probably neighbors. And because of what we were brought up in, our conscience was sheared with a hot iron. Our lives were already dictated for us by the sins that were being penetrated upon the innocence of our conscience, upon the reasoning of our mind, and the very desire of our flesh. And we said, when I'm old enough, I am going to I'm gone I'm going to go here you just wait when you shut the door as a teenager come on somebody after arguing with mom and papa whoever was your caregiver you remember saying don't worry one day I'll show you rebellion is in the heart of every man Rebellion is born in the heart of every woman. And if we do not have the power, the constraining force, and the design of a godly words, the godly uh, truth, we will become everything the devil wants us to be. And the reality is, Judah, look at this with me. With the pen of an iron and with the point of a diamond, it is graven upon the table of their heart. The sin has been written upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of your altars that even in the place of so-called religiosity, we find idolatry. Verse 1, historically and in context, talks about idolatry. Today in America, we are a nation full of idols. We're a nation that worships everything from sports teams to superstars. I wish I had a witness somewhere. And Christian entertainers. And then you come to find out they've been shacking up with everything on tour. Come on, somebody. Don't know who they are or who they is or what they be. It ain't good English, but it's the truth confused about their gender, confused about everything, and you allow them to entertain your children, you allow them to entertain yourself. We're full of idolatry in America. 
We got preachers who we worship. We set them on pedestals. Come on. We never prosecute them or process them through the trial because of immorality. Because they're the pastor. Because they're the CEO of the church. And they're bringing in nickels and noses. Happening every day in America, happening all the time within the body of Christ. And we worship these because they're on television. Do I have help here today or not? I know it's raining. It's messed your whole day up. Your hair's flopping and none of that stuff's working. You sprayed and it went left and you sprayed and it went right. Every time weather changes, people get all messed up. Isn't that right, sister? Sarah? They get all messed up. It's rain. It's been doing it for years. I wish I had somebody love me. The horns of the altar. Even the church is to the place where it's dangerous to allow children to be in the ministry. In the care of ministers. It's dangerous to allow pastors to be with people within the church. Because it's written an indelible mark in our hearts. That were full of sin and full of unrighteousness. No, America cannot be great. America cannot be great until we deal with certain things in our lives and in our churches. And I'm going to bear that out here today. So there's an indelible mark upon the heart and upon the altars. Verse 2, with their children, remember their altars. In other words, that indelible mark is not just you. It's not just in your heart, but it transfers generationally and it transfers to your children and your children have an indelible mark of the sin of your nation. You see, that's why I cannot go with the rest of the folks that are out there supporting politicians and getting all excited about a new day and a new opportunity. The children are still going to hell on a handbasket because we don't have things right in the American church. We don't have things right in the American schoolhouse. You can't even go in the schoolhouses today without being exposed to pornography. And the craziness, and I don't even want to bring out the statistics today, but it's insanity happening in our schools today. So how can you sit back on your thumb and rear back and say, man, we're awesome. Boy, this is great. Boy, what a day we're living in, man. Stock market's going up. This and this is happening. While we got teachers who are pedophilers taking young girls across America. And brother, that's only few that you know of. It's insanity. You want to tout and believe a political slogan. I'm going to preach to you the word of God. I'm going to tell you what God says and how God sees it. America will never be great again. It's impossible when we have idolatry. God will have no competition in your life or in any nation's life. God is sovereign and only him shall you worship. It's the king of kings and lord of lords, the reigning ruling monarch of the universe. And how dare we try to mix idolatry with pure worship. It don't work. God doesn't accept it. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The foundations of America are destroyed. The biblical foundations are destroyed. I don't care who you put in as Supreme Court justice. The very foundations of America are destroyed. And we're too worried about the dollar. We're too worried about our jobs. We're too worried about our future. We're too worried about making deals with this nation and bringing business back to this nation and so on and so forth. When the reality is we need to stop the world for just a minute and find a place of repentance and call upon that name and say, God, have mercy on America again. Have mercy on us. Our schools are shooting galleries and more is coming. And I'm going to tell you something, I don't know what type of massacre it will take for the American people to finally wake up and realize the hour that we're living in, but it's coming. I'm telling you, it's coming. But because I'm not popular enough and because I'm not the kind of person you want to look at and listen to, you shut me off and you turn others off. But I'm telling you, if we don't repent, we will see judgment in a greater way. 
teaching. Watch this, verse 2. With their children, remember the altars and the groves and the green trees upon the high hills. Think with me for a minute back to your childhood. Some of you were perfect. You were born with angels' wings. The only problem, your halo was crooked on your horns. But some of us were not brought up in that type of environment. Some of us remember the fighting and the argument and the beer drinking and the smashing against the walls and the guns being pulled. Some of us remember the cop cars showing up. Policemen, excuse me. One little ghetto there for a second. 5.0. Uh, we, we have all this. All this memory of what went on in our childhood, and it left that indelible mark upon us. But my point is this. If that caused us to live in the sin that we lived in, what in the world is it going to be when then little Johnny gets out of school? Come on. When little Lisa gets out of school, when it's time for them to be in leadership. But as I'm going to tell you right now, they're doing stuff. Come on now. You read it all the time. You're like, what? And he says here, your children remember. The Bible declares that the children are an inheritance of God, the fruit of the womb. That's his possession. That is his blessing. If we're, if we're giving him nothing for the future, then what is he going to do with the nation? I know it's getting quiet in this Presbyterian Catholic monastery. But the reality is still here. We're raising up a bunch of hellions because of the life we live. Come on now. Let me, let, me, let me just be honest and break this thing down. If I didn't come from a divorced home, I might have had a better beginning of my life. Come on now. If I didn't have the influence of sin that I had around my life and the influence of sin that you had around your life, you might have been a better knucklehead than you are right now. Come on now. You get saved and pastors got to fix that knuckleheadness you have. Someone never heard that before, knuckleheadness. Sister Delia was telling me, y'all preachers have their own vocabulary. We're going to write our own book, knuckleheadness. Charles Barkley, he don't have that. He's got, he says knucklehead all the time. But the, but the reality is this, we... It, we became that product because of the life that we lived and because of things that were around us and the influence. And my point is this, if we're influencing our children with Harry Potter, with Pokemon and all this other craziness and beauty and the beast and all this insanity that Satan is spewing upon our children, if we're allowing them to embrace it, what will they become? What will our nation become? I'll tell you what it'll become. Babylon. It already is. I'm reading you the Bible, and I'm prophesying at the same time the reality of where we are. He said, oh, my mountain in the field. Listen, Israel was blessed. Judah was blessed. The northern kingdom was blessed. But he said, listen, I am going to give your substance and all thy treasures to the spoil. We are so arrogant in America and so ignorant in America, we think it cannot happen to us. We think that we're invincible. We think that we have all the protection and that nothing by any means can harm us and nothing can touch our churches and nothing can touch our finances. Honey, the nation is going to hell in a handbasket and you don't even know it because you got your head somewhere the sun don't shine. If that's too tough, just you need to go. Is anybody here? It's a reality. It is the hour that we're living in, and nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to bring the remedy to Washington. Nobody wants to bring the remedy to Pennsylvania Avenue. Nobody wants to go and bring, I'll give you a bill to put on the, the president's desk. It's called the covenant of God. Sign that and agree with that. Amen. You can't legislate revival. You can't legislate love. You can't legislate righteousness. You can put laws out there, but men break laws because their hearts are wicked. I heard people say, well, we're not trying to elect a preacher. We need to. I put my name out there. And I think I got about a vote or two. I was only 98% short. 
How do you look at life, man? I was like, 2%? Awesome. <laughs> Yo, I'm going to run for dog catcher. What? He said, I'm going to give you substance. We think it's impossible. There are churches today that stand in their multi-million dollar ministries and their, their, their crystal cathedrals and all these things they have, and they think nothing can happen to them. Honey, I'm telling you, watch where you stand. Be careful the way you tread because there comes a payday forever, bud, for everybody every day. There's an opportunity for you to pay the piper. Think about with ministries. Think about them in your mind, great names that were all over the place. You no longer see them anymore. In fact, they're not even alive. Great ministries, great buildings. But see, we're so arrogant in America, we think it can't happen to us. We think that these things, it's impossible for our nation to go through. Watch this. Give your substance and all the treasures to the spoil and thy high places for what exchange? Sin. How the mighty have fallen. How those that are great end up so small. And we think and we have so much arrogance and we say it cannot happen to us. It's an impossibility. Look at our military. Look at all the things that we have. And yet we are hanging on a string. So close to the edge of eternity. We are so vulnerable as a nation. I'm going to tell you something. We're headed into Babylonian captivity. I believe we're already at the city limits. We don't recognize and realize it, but we are there because of our sin. Verse 4, and thou even thyself shall discontinue from thine inheritance that I gave thee. See, people don't believe that God can take something back that he gave. Is anybody here? We really think that if God gave us something, he don't have the right to take it back. He not only has the right, he's got the ability to do it. And it's because you forfeited your right. Think of the nations that have come up and the nations that have gone down, the dictators and the leaders and people in great places and power. Think about them. Think about the musicians. Think about stars and football personalities and sports personalities and all these people who rode the high wave now are down low and not even on the earth today. Don't tell God what he can do and cannot do. He's sovereign. That's the problem with the American church. We don't know God because we don't have preachers who preach about God. They preach about themselves and their personalities. You're going to discontinue from the heritage that I have gave thee, and I will cause thee to serve thine enemies and the land which thou knowest not. For you have kindled a fire and my anger wherein shall burn forever. He says, you have brought this upon yourself because of your sin. Come on now. We live in a nation where we don't preach the gospel anymore. Again, it's about personality. It's about how much money the preacher has. How he flaunts everything that he has and says, hey, you can be like me, man, stunning Steve. You can be like me, man. I'm the guy. I, you know, look, look, look what I've got. Look what you can have. When the reality is our nation out there is on fire, our children are being molested by pedophiles, and all the craziness is taking place, but all we have time to do in the American church is sit and listen to Mr. Wonderful, who doesn't have a problem at all. There ain't a care in the world. Everything's just wonderful. We've turned the church into an entertainment center. We've turned the church into a place where we do gymnastics. Pastor friend of mine, Ken Roberts down in Florida, he sent me this picture of a flag in front of a church. It was the Zumba flag. If you don't know what Zumba is, it goes back to the African dance. But Zumba on a flag on in the front yard in the front part of a church. What have we become? The YMCA? What have we become? A social club? We're all going to do the Zumba. I didn't know how to do it. I gave you my birth best Tybo. That's all I know. 
Zumba. Are you with me, church? It is a laughing matter, but it's a shame to the King of kings and Lord of lords that all we can do is make a church into a civic center and a civic organization. We might as well be selling Tupperware. Let's do a Tupperware outreach. I can justify we're going to make money for the church or we're going to witness too. Is anybody here today? And that's the reality of our churches. You say, well, that's just one place. I don't care. It needs to be no place. Zumba. I think I pulled a muscle in my leg. But I'm going to be all right. I'm fine. You just be be glad I didn't do a backflip. I didn't want to show off. Come on now, look at the insanity of our churches and we wonder why our children have no reverence to God. They don't care about the things of God because we got old people rolling on a big ball (laughs) in the house of God. I ain't rolling on no ball. Y'all ain't helping me. I... Y'all may do it. Some of you athletic folks, you might roll on a ball. You ain't never going to catch me in stretchy pants rolling on a ball. In my house or in the back of my property or never in the church. Boy, it's funny, but it's a sad shame. What do you remember the most about church? John, little Johnny, I remember pastor rolling around a pair of stretchy pants on a ball. Pink at that. Come on now. And you wonder why we're all messed up. You wonder why we ain't got no power. You wonder why there's no signs and wonders and miracles. You wonder why our neighborhoods are in such shambles and there's craziness going on and the devil is laughing at the church because we're too busy playing poker in the house of God while the world burns. Watch now. Now that I got your attention. Verse 5, listen to the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, not me, not headquarters, not Nashville. Come on, somebody. Not some other place, not Cleveland, Tennessee. For the Lord saith, cursed is the man that trusts in man. Now, let me give you the definition in the Hebrew of the word trust there. It means to have careless confidence. Cursed is the man. To have careless confidence in men. Now, I love my brothers and sisters. I love you and I appreciate you. I hope if I ever called you, you'd be right there. You'd help me out. But I am not going to put my confidence in you carelessly, and neither should you put it in me carelessly, that I am going to depend on you for the very salvation of my life, the very soul of my being, the very supply of my survival. I'm not going to put my careless confidence in no man or no woman. But the reality is that that the church of America and America itself is so codependent upon the needs of others, we have never found a sovereign relationship with God on our own. We've trusted on preacher man. We've trusted on prophet so-and-so. And we've trusted on organization rather than relationship. I wish somebody catch what I just said. And the reality is that because we have tried to be corporate instead of individual with God, we've lost that power of relationship. And when we come together corporately, we're just a mess in another country club. I'm telling you the truth. And then preacher man got to try to fix it on Sunday, try to fix it on Wednesday, and he cannot lift it all. That's why you got to have a relationship with God. Curse, curses have been... Putting confidence, careless confidence in somebody. And that's exactly what the church did with this election. That's exactly what you're doing right now, preacher man, getting involved in politics. You are carelessly putting your confidence in a man, in a business, in an organization, whatever it may be. And God says, I'll have no other before me. I am sovereign. Look, I I love everybody. But there's some of you folks, I would never get in a car and let you drive me. I'm looking at everybody. I love you all, but if you said, hey, you need a ride, I'll just keep walking. 
No, I'll be to Tacoa by tonight. I'll be like my grandma. If I had to get in the car because of a tornado coming or some big old red dragon chasing me with fire coming out of his nose, and I had to get in there, I'm going to do like my grandma used to do, grab hold of the chicken gripper. Some of y'all don't even know what a chicken gripper is. That's that little thing you hold on, either here or there. I guarantee I'll leave my mark before we get out of that car. Is anybody here today? There's just some people you shouldn't ride with. There's some people you shouldn't let behind the wheel. There's some people you shouldn't be in the same car with. But the reality is the church of America has got in the bed with the beast system, has got in the bed with this political system, and we're allowing whoever we want to drive us over the cliff. I ain't going with you. As for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. As for me and my church, we're going to serve Jesus, and we're going to preach the blessed truth. I don't care if I'm trending now or trending never. We're going to bless the name of the Lord. We're going to lift our voices before him and see the glory of God in a perverted nation. Careless confidence. I, I can't believe how many people are so codependent upon their preacher. Don't you ever become codependent upon me. Let me say that again. Don't you ever become codependent on me. You better learn how to pray. You better learn how to get in the Bible for yourself. You better learn how to carry your own splinters from carrying your cross because I can't carry mine and yours. Well, we don't hear that preaching in the church. We say, oh, hey, come on down here. Oh, yeah, you know, you can't do anything without me. Oh, you need me to lay hands on you. <laughs> come on now. You, you, you watch TV, TV and any other kind of Christian program, you would think, oh, my God, how am I alive without him? <laughs> Folks, y'all ain't watched Christian television in a while, but I'm telling you, you about to get done with there. You, you got to have that CD. You need to get my book or you're going to die. <laughs> I'm telling you. He, Mike's, needs, Mike's, Mike's hurting over here, his ribs from, from laughing. <laughs> I'm I making it funny, and I wish it was hilarious, but the reality is that's where the church is, and we don't know God. And we're listening to other preachers. We're listening to those with large platforms telling us how we should do and how we should go and whose car to ride in. I ain't going in your car. You're going to have to blindfold me, gag me, and throw me in the trunk. If it's one of them new cars, I know where that button is. I'm getting out. Now, if you're an old Impala, you ain't getting out of an Impala. How many all know what I'm talking about? You might as well just say goodbye and say, hello, Jesus. Watch this. And maketh flesh his arm. It means this, to make flesh his strength. My strength does not come from a man. My strength does not come from a government. My strength does not come from headquarters. My strength cometh from the Lord. He is my supply and he is my source. Though I love everybody in here, you're not my source. God is my source and I am not your source. He is your source alone. Oh, but together when we come together and we bridge together and we plank together and we're strong together and we recognize and realize that God is for us and who could ever be against us, I'm telling you, we become a force that's unmovable. That's what the church needs today. But we're not in relationship with God. We're in relationship with a church. There is a difference. We're in relationship with a building and a seat. Ah, I wish I had something. We're in a relationship with an obligation and a conscience that feels bad when you don't show up. That's where we are in America. Honey, the true church, you come overseas with me sometime. Uh, the true church will stand out in the rain. The true church will go anywhere, go anywhere, do anything to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ preached to them. The true church does not care about popularity. The true church does not care about money. The true church does not care about the things of the world. And we don't lean on the arm of the flesh. Think about the totality of the flesh. It stinks. You don't bathe the flesh. You may get away for about a day or two. Don't make me go there. Then all of a sudden, that arid, extra dry, 24-hour protection starts to fade away. Listen to me now. 
And the reality is we trust in people who have never been bathed in the blood. They've never been bathed in the word. They've never been bathed in righteousness. They never had their minds clean and conscience clear with holiness and righteousness. Yet we support them and we say, drive us on. Take us to our destiny. Uh Uh-uh, no way. I ain't going with you. I'll go the way of the Lord. Are you still in the building? Watch this. Who maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. I'm not putting my confidence, I'm not putting my strength in somebody who has departed from the Lord. Listen to me, Ignited. I know you got this, but there are multiplied hundreds that are listening right now who don't have this in your mind and don't have this understanding. God is your source, and in him, you trust. He's the rock. He's your shield. He's your buckler. He's all that you need. But there are people that trust in bishops and prelates and all kinds of people of authority in the pomp and circumstance of high church. I can do high church. I can do all that craziness, been there, done that, sat up on there on the big chairs. But I'm going to tell you something. Could you see me up there? I've been making faces at everybody. I've been throwing airplanes. I remember one time when I was, I was a protege being you know, raised up, I had to sit up there, and I hated it in that big chair. King do nothing. Is anybody here? Come on. I don't mind, and I understand church politics. I got all that. But, honey, if you're unclean, if your heart departed from God, if you're full of sin and I don't see no fruit of righteousness, I don't see no fruit of repentance, I don't see any holiness in you, honey, I'm not following you. But right now, people will go to church. They'll shuffle in and shuffle out and listen to some six-foot icicle, Dr. Jack Frost. Preach some type of pablum and be satisfied with ritual and routine and go right back into the world and on Monday become a chameleon and you can't tell whether they've been born again or not. And we wonder why God is going to judge America. America will never be great again because of our sin. America will never become who she once was because of the unrighteousness of our nation. And I'm going to prove it to you in just a minute. If you got the stomach to hang out with me for just a little longer. You know, I didn't hear no amen, but I'm going to go on. I heard the Holy Spirit say, preach it. Verse 19. Thus saith the Lord unto me. I'm going to give you right now. You remnant that listen to me right now in this church and those that are watching me now, let me give you your marching orders. Let me give you your assignment. You don't need to read another book and you don't need to go to another conference. I'm going to give it to you right here. Are you ready? It ain't going to cost you nothing unless you click that button for giving. Watch this. Are you ready? Verse 19. Thus saith the Lord unto me, go. That's point number one, go. Point number two, stand. Where am I going to stand? I'm glad you asked. In the gate of the children of the people, whereby the kings of Judah come in, and by which they go out in all the gates of Jerusalem. Honey, quit trying to preach to the choir. Quit trying to preach to other Christians. Go to the places where authority is. Go to the places where the drug dealers are. Go to the places where witchcraft is going on. Go to the places where they're making sacrifice. And stand there and declare the word of the Lord. Quit trying to go and proselyte Christians. I, I, can, I can hang out there for about two hours. That's why the, 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 the nation hasn't been won and born again. We're too busy trying to beat each other up. We're trying to give each other's revelations and prophecies. We're trying to spread all kinds of stuff that we heard instead of going to the place of the sinner and telling the sinner the good news about Jesus Christ. I'm just telling you like it is. You may not like me. You may defriend me from Facebook. Good. I don't know what to do with you anyway. Listen, I'm telling you, I'm going to get in trouble. You know, people get mad, Elder, but that's okay. You got my back? I appreciate it. Brother Ma, you got, you help me out too. 
But I'm going to tell you, most of the things that goes on on social media is, dry, is just trying to compete with other Christians to one-up each other on a prophetic revelation or a dream or something they heard, and it becomes a place of competition instead of conviction and bringing about revival. Honey, get off of Facebook. Get off of this book and that book and get into the Word of God and go to the nations of the world preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. To be honest with you, I don't read 99% of the stuff that comes to me. <gasps> Shocking. I don't have time. I ain't got time to read your stupidity. I'm just going to be honest with you, man. I'm, I'm serious. You ain't got no greater revelation than the word of God anyways. And neither do I. Telling me you had a dream of a banana and, and some wafers and all of a sudden banana pudding came to pass. And, come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. And then ask me to discern it. Get a spoon. Come on, somebody. Come on, man. You know what I'm talking about. Get you a bowl. Get you a, 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 a foam bowl so you ain't got to wash it. Listen, I'm telling you, man, it's, it's insanity. Now, I'm not talking about everybody. There's some powerful things on there. But the reality is this, that we live in this cyber world of make-believe and things that really don't matter. Honey, go reach the lost. Watch this, verse 19. Thus saith the Lord unto me, go and stand. Where? In the place of authority, in the place where it matters the most. Quit trying to save Christians. They're already saved, I hope. I got to go. I got to go. Y'all looking at me, man. Your fangs are hanging out. Watch this, verse 20. And say unto them, hear the word of the Lord, you kings of Judah, and all Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem that enter in by these gates. So he says, I want you to go, I want you to stand, and I want you to say what? What I'm telling you to say, and that's to repent. I'm telling you repentance is the message of the hour. I've been preaching that, declaring it from this pulpit. It's repentance. But we don't want to preach repentance. I would hope that the majority of the people who follow me on Facebook are saved. I would hope. So what am I going to do? Why am I going to waste my time trying to get people right with God when they should already be right? Now, I understand all the ramifications. You get people closer to God and they get convicted. I got all that stuff. But my point is this. Go Stand and stay. Say the word of the Lord. Say what God is saying. Speak the word in this hour. Verse 21. I'm not done, so don't even act like I'm going anywhere. Thus saith the Lord. Take heed. Take heed. The word is shamar in the Greek, in the Hebrew, shamar. What does shamar mean? You all know what it means. It means to guard and to be a watchman. It's the same word that was used to Adam when God said, keep the garden, Adam, shamar it. And Adam did not shamar, and we are now part of the problem. So he says, what are you going to do? I'm going to tell the people to shamar, to guard, and to be careful, and to watch themselves. I understand there comes a time when you have to Wake up a backslidden church. I got that. And I recognize and realize that is a job of a watchman. But I'm going to tell you, we should spend more time reaching the lost souls Amen. and protecting our children from the hands of the devil than to be preaching to one another. Thus saith the Lord, take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it by in by the gates of Jerusalem. What is he talking about? Holiness. Consecration. Sanctification. Getting closer to God. You know, today we preach in the church how close you can get to the world with still going to heaven. 
How close can you get to the world and hell and still make heaven? Honey, I want to preach how far away I can get away from it and how much I can receive when I receive the blessings of God and my reward in that final day. Shamar, keep it. Verse 22. Well, verse 23 says they didn't even obey. Don't even want to hear it. Shut off preachers who preach like I do and like others do. Watch this, verse 24. And I shall come the pass of you diligently hearken unto me, saith the Lord, to bring no burden through the gates of the city on the Sabbath day, but hallow the Sabbath day. There it is. Hallow, holiness. To do no work therein, then shall there enter into the gates of the city kings and princes. Now, I want you to read the rest of that on your own. He's saying this. He says, in order for you, Jerusalem, you, Israel, to become great again, you must get to the place of holiness and righteousness. You must hallow that day. You must hallow your relationship with me. I'm telling you, American church, we are never going to see America again until we hallow the things of God in the house of God and in our homes as well. The mantra of this hour in the world of politics and the church is to make America great again. I'm telling you the word from heaven and the very courts of God is make America holy again. Holiness has departed the country. Holiness has departed the church. Holiness has left the preachers. It's no longer part of the, the creed and the code of a man or a woman of God. America's in decline. I'm closing. Maybe. America's in decline. When you can't even get on an airplane without having your nose fractured and being knocked on conscience, and having a concussion, an airplane. I'm just going from here to there, and I paid my money, but now i got to worry about the Gestapo and the Stasi and the KGB. Oh, sorry, I mean TSA. I... Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to give you a real quick picture of America. Are you ready for this? And then how could you sit there and deny that everything's great and we're wonderful when you can't even go on an airplane and you get dragged off of it and you get your brains beat in when a doctor needs a doctor? What a woman was on an airplane just the other day with two twin babies and they smacked her in the head with a metal stroller in her own stroller. And then they're going to pick a fight, and the flight attendant said, come on, hit me, hit me. What is this, WWF Airlines? Hulk Hogan's the captain. What is this? Next time I fly, I'm going to give me one of my old, you know, iron suits that they used to, the knights in shining armor. I don't know, maybe you all like getting molested. Maybe you all like getting your face cracked in and the craziness. It's insanity. And somebody says, well, that's just a small microcosm. It's the reality of where we are in America that you can't even get on an airplane. What happened to fly the friendly skies? <laughs> Sir, you can find your pillow and your blanket and your taser <laughs> on the upper compartment. When a fight breaks out, there's a shield that'll come down, just put it over your head and over your children. No body fluids will get on you. It's what it is. But we're fine. America's great again, man. This is awesome. Well, don't you think you're kind of being a little bit sarcastic? Listen, this is reality. You sold us the bill of lies that everything's going to be great. This is going to be a utopia, and you're going to legislate love and legislate life and legislate peace and all these different things, and we got ladies getting hit, hit in the head with a stroller. This is stuff you used to read in a comic book or watch on Mad TV when you used to watch that junk. 
Oh, man, I'm not making this stuff up. Some of y'all don't even know because you don't even read the newspaper. Is anybody here? And not only that, we got Facebook killers. Now we're like Hollywood. I don't need no director. All I do is just take my camera. I go get me a, a, a go cam or whatever it's called, and I'm just going to film me blowing somebody away. And they're going to allow it to take place. I'm so close to saying goodbye to Facebook. There's an article about child porn. I got I to gotta find out a little more information about it. But if I find out that stuff is going on, you may say, say goodbye to me on Facebook. No, I'm telling you what to do. I'm just telling you, you ain't, you ain't putting my name on this junk. I'm about getting tired of it all. Is anybody with me? We have power outages in America the other day. San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles. Still don't know the real reason for it. Now the latest is that it was possibly part of a solar storm. My point is this, that we are vulnerable as a nation. Whether it's an enemy within or something without, we are vulnerable. We are on a planet full of sin and we are shaking our fists at a sovereign God when all it takes is one rock from space and destroy an entire continent and send you back to the Stone Age as well as to the frozen tundra. But we're defiant. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that when the meteorites begin to fall and the great calamity happens on the people, they will shake their fist at God and still curse him. No matter how hard I preach, no matter how big this platform ever becomes, there still will be rebellion in the heart of men. But you look at this and you say, these are precursors. Regardless of who flipped the switch, regardless of how it happened, these are precursors to be ready for the days that are coming. And I'm going to tell you something else. It's also a reason to get out of some of your big cities. Yeah, I said it. Get out of them big cities. I'd get in the place where they still grow corn in the backyard. Say, so, well, if you lose power there, we're going to be all right. We know how to cook. You, you, think, you think I'm crazy. There was just a survey done in the United Kingdom, and they just right down the road, by the way. Some of y'all live in Tacoma, you don't understand, but it ain't that far. It's just a couple-hour flight. They called over the pond. But they just had a survey, one in five, one in five adults do, do not know how to screw in a light bulb. Read it. One in five do not know how to boil an egg. Only 57% of that population can fix a flat tire. Folks, you ain't getting none on what I'm telling you right now. You think about flapjacks and, and shonies and going out to eat. Are you here with me? 37%, they did, only 37% know how to get a stain out of their clothes. And you made fun of my knuckleheadness comment earlier. Honey, I wouldn't want to know what the survey would be for America. You say, Pastor, what does that matter for me about all this? It matters tons because we don't know what we're doing in the basic life and survival. What do you think is going to happen when the world totally turns and heads into the end times? Worse than it is now. I love, oh, yeah, people who, who are part of this ministry in the UK, and I love everybody around the world, but this is how you screw in a light bulb. And if you're talented, you can use this hand. It's not hard. Or stand on your brother's back. It don't matter. You don't need a ladder. And an egg boil. Are you ready? Here's how you boil an egg. Just wait. Just wait. It'll start cracking, and you'll think it's over, but just wait. Is anybody here today? It's just an honesty. It's just reality of where we are. And we think we're going to make the world great. We think we're going to make everything beautiful. We're in trouble. We're in trouble in this nation. The retail bubble is, has already busted in America. 
Over 8,640 stores will close in 2017. Worse, worse than in the third quarter of 2008. And we in the first quarter, just about, is that right? We're already worse than 2008. But America's great, man. Just the other day, a Navy SEAL was arrested. And he was arrested on several charges. And one of the charges was that he molested a woman who was unconscious. And when they dug deeper into his lifestyle, they found out that he was stashing pornography, child pornography. In fact, had some images of an infant having sex with a dog. And you want to make America great again, and we have this insanity going on in our nation, and that doesn't break your heart, preacher. That doesn't break your heart, politician. I hope that shocked you as it shocked me and made my stomach churn. But that's the reality of where we are. And by the way, he wasn't the first Navy SEAL in the last, three, last nine months or so. There was two others that have been caught with different crimes. One was adultery and one was murder. The elite. It's a microcosm. It's a prophetic landmark and an illustration of where we are. We're not great. And we'll never be great unless we fall upon the rock, lest the rock crush us. But you won't hear that preach in your churches today. Oh, that's too hard. That's too raw. Really? You read this Bible, and you'll find out how God was blatant in his description of sin. You read, that's the problem. That is the problem. We've let the world describe sin. We let the world describe adult situations and all these things instead of allowing the word to tell us the way it is and to understand that God does have an issue with these things. How can we not be judged with what I just told you? Well, that's that, and we're here, and this is this, and that is that. No, this is the reality of our nation, and I could go on. Verse 25. I got so excited I lost my place. Sickening, folks. Sickening. And if we really knew what goes behind closed doors, what goes on behind the secret places, I, I wonder if it even make a difference. I really wonder. I really, really wonder, would it really make a difference to the church if it just came out as blatant as it possibly could be on television and the horrors of what's happening in our schools and political places? I really wonder if the church would really give a rip. I seriously doubt it by the condition of the church. We ought to be falling on our face, repenting. And we want to go to battle? We want to go to war. We want to say we're great and we're back because we're killing civilians. We've killed more civilians of the U.S. military in the past few months than all of Russia and Syria did. Is anybody here with me? These are realities on the ground. Nobody wants to hear it. Nobody likes it. But it's the reality of it. And we should repent of it. Verse 25. Then shall there come into thy gates of the city the kings and princes sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and of horses, and they and their princes for men of Judah. Talking about the blessing. And of Jerusalem and the city shall remain forever. And they shall come from the cities of Judah and from the places about Jerusalem and from the land of Benjamin and from the plain and from the mountains and from the south, bringing their burnt offerings and the sacrifices, the meat offerings. goes on and on talking about how the blessings would be. But finally, in verse 27, but if you will not hearken unto me in the hallow and hallow the Sabbath day and not to bear a burden, even returning or entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Heavenly Father, I've delivered the message you gave me. I pray that the church finds a place to repent today and say, God, forgive us for our arrogance before your throne. Father, I know there's sin everywhere. There's sin every day. Nations do terrible things. Terrible things happen every moment, and you see them all. 
But when we stand and say in the name of Jesus, in the name of God, that we're without sin, when we stand and say in God we trust and God bless our nation, when we stand behind pulpits and speak half-truths and deny the reality of what's going on around us, Father, that is hypocrisy, and that is something you will judge America for. I pray for the remnant that heard me today that they would go stand and say, not to the believers, but to those who don't know Christ, to go into the places of authority and declare in Jesus' name, these are the words of the Lord. Father, there are many who contact me and tell me that they send these messages to their pastors. They try to reach their pastors, but they won't listen. I pray for them today. Go, stand, and say. And don't be afraid of the faces. And don't be afraid of those who would chastise you and castigate you and speak evil of you. This is the hour to stand up and declare the word of the Lord. Father, I pray for repentance to come first at the house of God. I pray, Father God, that you would heal the church, that those listening to my voice right now would find a place in their home to make an altar, to call upon you, and to have mercy upon us. This is unsustainable. The sin of this nation is unsustainable sustainable in that of the world. Jesus, I've preached what your word declares. I pray that your people respond in faith. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. I love you. I bless everybody in the house today. I want to ask you that you would continue to pray for the needs of the church. Continue to pray for the changes that are taking place in the house as we work on our music. Pray for uh, all the other needs. We're going to pray for Brother Tony right now. If everybody can just kind of stretch your hands. If he can, can you come here, Tony?